Hello and welcome to Cormac Chats Podcast. In this week's episode, we're going to be talking about the upcoming UFC card, as well as the previous top three fights from the main event from the Shevchenko Grasso card. Um, it should be a really interesting one. If you'd like to start us off. Yeah, so last week, obviously, we had the card for Mexico Independence Day. Um, it was a very interesting sort of dynamic on the uh, on the stream for the UFC. Brendan Moreno coming in for the last, I think it was three or four fights on the commentary, I think. Also, the first four-man commentary desk, so that was interesting, uh, to say the least. It worked well, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, getting into the fights, obviously, Raul Rojas Jr., the youngest active UFC fighter on the roster, um, 18 years of age, which is just crazy to think about. And he came out aggressive, looking better on the feet than we've ever seen him, getting the early finish. Um, Terence Mitchell started slow, you know, wasn't... Wasn't the best showing from him, but Raul Rojas looked dangerous and he looked he looked like he really wanted to prove his last loss. It's one of these things like Raul Rojas, he's gone into the UFC at such a young age. He's done very well to have gotten this far this quickly. Mm. As in, on that main stage, you know, he's fighting on the big Mexico card, Mexican Independence Day, um, which is also why it was such a big, well, not win for Grasso, but such a big result for Grasso <laughs> retaining a title. But um yeah no I'm really impressive. If we look at his previous performances, it, he's he's it's hard because entering the UFC you're almost always going to be fighting much more experienced fighters than you at the age of eighteen. The majority of people in there are entering in their twenties, mid twenties, a lot of the time their late twenties. Yeah. And he's fighting against people who you know who are a lot more experienced and have a lot more knowledge of the UFC as an organization. But the way he came out, I mean Terence, he, he didn't look. He didn't look as fast as he needed to be. He wasn't as on it as he needed to be. But I don't think he was necessarily off it. I, I just didn't think Raul Rojas. The distance management was terrible from Terence Mitchell, in my opinion. He's throwing a head kick from so far out. Well, this is the thing. When when you do have that range, because with Raul Rojas, he's, he's a stocky mm. person. He's a very stocky individual. He's built very well he's built like a wrestler I can't believe he's he looks like a full blown adult he's 18 he's years younger than us he looks like he's been training up, up until the age of like 30 yeah it's crazy like, you know it's, it's, it's nuts really but um yeah no when you have that advantage with the reach and when you have that advantage with the distance management you need to utilize it better mm. and in all fairness it's a lot easier said than done when you have a Raul Rojas Jr. sprinting at you, throwing shooting bombs. take down, throwing bombs. It was a left hand which put him out, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Or put him stiff almost, but he recovered so quickly. Like mm. the way he dropped was like a brutal one shot KO for a second. It's, it's one of these things like these these left hands. Like it always, it feels like it's often the left hand as well. Yeah, which yeah, does it, which is interesting, really. For like it's the same in other sports. Like obviously we're big football fans, and the left footers there just seem like they strike a ball so well, and then. The UFC, it's like they strike a punch so well. Obviously, big punches like Conor McGregor, etc. From that southpaw stance, that left hand is always money. Maybe the secret is just being left-handed. Yeah, I always wish I was left-handed. <laughs> I, I suppose it kind of makes you... Um, I, I was going to say, it kind of puts your head in the ball, but it doesn't really, I think doesn't really have an impact, does it? Like As well, it's hard. It's not as easy, obviously, to find southpaw training partners. So when you get a good southpaw. I'm not actually sure if Rojas is southpaw. I mean, it was a left straight, I think, so it would It was a left straight, but yeah. to be fair, it, I'm, I'm not too sure. It was um, it, it, it was a left straight, but it could yeah. have been, it could have been something. Stand switch or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But either way, that, the, that shot from southpaw is very powerful and he landed a bomb on Mitchell's chin. And surprised he didn't go out, followed up with nasty ground and pound. He was like, like, so, like he took his lunch money the way he was going after him on the ground, so aggressive. It's one of those things that really, I mean, there's not a lot you can do about it when you're in that situation. It is one of those things. Like, you, you, you're you getting dropped like that. You yeah. know, it's, um, it, it's, you see a shot like that, you're, you're kind of almost guaranteed out, out of it, presuming it's as big as it looks. Mm. And it looked like a big shot, and it, I'm sure it felt like it too. Yeah, it definitely felt like it. Uh, I'm not sure really where you can push Real Rojas from here, because at Bantamweight, it's just the top 15 is stacked with killers. Obviously, we saw... Damon Blackshear, who's not even ranked in the top 15, get the twist to win the other week. And then he fought, I think, Mario Bautista a week later. And we saw the level of those two fighters in that fight. And they're around the top 15 right now. But I think pushing Raul Rojas into that as an 18-year-old kid would be very dangerous. But 
you know, he's beat, he's beaten some people that are around the rankings. So, do you think you can push him into the rankings this early? So, I, I think that the best thing for him to do would be to fight a few more contenders. Hmm. Or to fight a few more people coming up, should I say, rather than contenders. But these people who are coming off the contender series, these people who are coming up, these people who are being signed to the UFC, hmm. because there's a lot of talent being signed. And for him to be put against these fighters so young, in my opinion, could very much potentially be a mistake. Yeah, I think that you can't have him punch above his weight. I'm um, not to say that he wouldn't be doing bits, but at the same time, that top 15 is, like you said, very, very dangerous. Yeah. I think that logically it might make some sense to give him some more up-and-coming, not-ranked opponents. Definitely. And there's always people being signed, always people being cut. Mm. There's going to be somebody who's coming up, which would be a suitable fit for him. And even then, I mean... The UFC, the top 15 in the bantamweight, like, what, what is there lower down? Lower down on what is the Mara Bautistas and the Domon Blackshears and people like that. And it's very dangerous fights. It's, it's one of those things that's hard, really, because when it's that stats, it's one of those things that maybe this is what he needs hmm. to, you know, just to fight someone between that top 10, top 15 range. Just to see where it is, not so you know continuously throwing against his opponents. We we it's not like we haven't seen him lose in the UFC. I mean, he lost his last fight to I think it was Rodriguez, who I think ranked number fifteen or just outside the top fifteen. So has that really shown us that he can't make that jump? And obviously, he moved. I think it was to Ray Longo's gym and showed great improvements in this fight. I mean, it didn't last very long, but. You could just tell like how more comfortable he was in the striking. Kind of reminded me of like one of the early days of like the really good wrestlers coming in, where everyone's scared of the takedown threat, and then they're looking to lead that big lead hook, big left hand, and you know he impl implemented that very well. So I think yeah, maybe we've even seen like you kind of the UFC can sign maybe sign some regional fighters who aren't doing too bad who. Are, Maybe at the older stage to give them a little chance in the UFC to fight Rao Rojas. We've seen people built up fighting debutants before. And like Sean O'Malley was one who for ages was fighting non-ranked opponents. And look where that got him now. So I think the smart thing would be to, you know, build him up slowly. He wants to jump in the deep end, but I don't think that's smart. I think if we, um, we see him fight another recently signed UFC debutant, or not necessarily a debutant, but somebody perhaps non-ranked mm. and we see how the striking fares against them because if it's a consistent thing then there is most certainly the potential to go forward yeah it's one of those things though a 56 second fight is very very hard to gauge at the end of the day it maybe could have gone a different way that day if there was anticipation that rojas would go out like that mm. so and that's the thing really it's really hard to call um he's only 18 yeah, and that's crazy. <laughs> a lot of these fighters who are, you know, debuting in the UFC are 26, 27, mm. 23, 25, yeah. 30. There's fighters on tough who are in their 30s. Quite literally, yeah. you know, fighters in their 30s who are just making it to the UFC. Whether or not we'll see another, some more bantam weights come up with his kind of, with his kind of ability to potentially put them against who yeah. are unranked. That might be a good shout. At the same time, you don't want to put me too good, earn him on too good. It also would be interesting to see him tested, though. Yeah. Tested yeah. again, especially after that performance. I think maybe you give him a like a non ranked, experienced, older guy who's maybe like looking, maybe someone on the end of their career who's had a few decent wins in the UFC. I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll do like a pod just based on where, where we can put these young up and contenders and who they can get ranked uh, put against because I think it'd be interesting to look into who these guys can really fight. Trouble is a lot of these older guys are just very much, even at the end of their career, they're just too experienced. Mm, yeah. And that's, that's the issue. It's, it's a really hard one, but at the end of the day, he's only 18. He's got hopefully years and years ahead of him. So I think that's going to be a slow build up. Um, He's doing... He's, he's looking very promising, but at the same time, you don't want to throw him against anything too good. Maybe someone in the top 15, just try it out again. Mm. But at the same time, it's very risky, and I feel like they're a non-ranked opponent. Another one might be a good shout. Hopefully, this one will last a bit longer so we can see a more prolonged display of his yeah. attributes. Well, yeah, I think enough said on that fight. We'll jump into one. I have a, a few things on my mind about this next fight that kind of bothered me a little bit. Um, I don't know if you were seeing it, but... Kevin Holland was obviously in the press uh, 
you've kind of said to me before you don't sometimes don't like the way Kevin Holland like presents himself in these sort of interviews and I do see your point because someone asked him um how he feels about the world weight division kind of slowing up obviously we haven't got no title fight I don't think there's any uh fight in the top 10 that's actually put together yet so and but he he answered the question and they asked him how, why he isn't wanting to go for the title and he kind of just got all salty about it and went off on the reporter saying you've never fought before all this stuff and you know it kind of at that point I kind of thought Kevin Holland was going to lose I predicted him to win but after that interview I think he kind of when he's fighting good fighters it kind of seems like he puts excuses in like the Wonderboy fight he agreed not to wrestle and you know he's a very good fighter but if he doesn't take this sport seriously he, he can't get nowhere out of it it's one of these things. We look at Kevin Holland. He's he fights. It feels like he fights a lot, but he always kind of fights towards the end of the year. So maybe it's just like he wants a year long holiday, and you know, half a year long holiday, mm. and then yeah, then he wants to just you know. But um, I, I can't imagine that's the case. That's that's not a serious comment. But um, with Kevin Holland, uh, he's it doesn't like you said. It doesn't feel like he always turns up against these bigger guys, mm. and he's not always doing what it takes. And I don't know whether it's uh, to do with an element of showmanship. He wants to show off certain traits. He has certain kicks because he has some very, very high-level strikes. Yeah. He's a very high-level striker. But even in this Jack Della Madonna fight, he, he was not, in my opinion, showing what he needed to show, doing what he needed to do to potentially come off a win. It was a very close fight. Mm. But what he was throwing, even towards the last stages of it, if you're in a fight and it's that close you need to be putting some power beyond your strikes. It's all about a lot more. It is, it is. And in a fight like that, when he's significantly underperforming in the strikes thrown, you need to be throwing damaging shots. Mm. Now, in complete fairness, Jack Della Maddalena, his defence is beyond high level. He's a great boxer, so good. His, his guard, the way mm. he covers up, the way he, the way he just moves in general, his upper body movement, you know, his torso upwards, is very high level and he's very good at evading. But what I noticed with the fight is whenever Kevin Holland was going forward with the jab in the straight, he was backing him up and he just didn't do that enough. Mm. And all it would have taken is because a guard's good, but a guard will only last you for so long until mm. your guard breaks. Yeah. Because after a certain point, after your arms being hit by powerful straights and jabs, a guard isn't like a metal mask no. you know it's, it's not it's not a helmet it's not like they got 12 ounce boxing gloves on is it quite literally and the, your arms do take a beating mm. and with someone like Kevin Holland he has such a reach the way he was fighting almost felt as if he was fighting somebody who was similar height to him yeah who was as if he was a you know because he's a tall person as well he's a very tall fighter mm. the leg kicks they weren't really doing anything I mean, Jack did a brilliant job of checking them. Like, most leg kicks I thought were checked. And it was weird because on the strikes, they were counting the, like they It's like they count check leg kicks as a strike Holland's way. Where mm. if you check a leg kick, it, it's not a strike on you. I mean, if we're going shin to shin and you're kicking me, I'm pretty sure that they're going to be coming off worse. And that's the thing. And these leg strikes, they weren't doing anything to stop going forward. No. They really weren't. That is almost when Jack Delamere Lena, in my opinion, did best when he was able to get in close mm. to Kevin Holland. Another thing as well, where was the wrestling at? Yeah. This is an I opponent which once. you need to wrestle against because on the feet, doing what you're doing, unless you're going to be trying to box them, which, to be fair, would have still worked a lot better. Not to say he wasn't trying to box, but he wasn't, he wasn't doing the right type of boxing. He wasn't putting enough behind it. He wasn't keeping it long enough either. He he wasn't he wasn't it was he was forcing Jack Della Maddalena up every so often and whenever we would force Jack up he would just have some success but but this is the thing like there was no power behind it yeah, even yeah. in these even when he was backed up the strikes he was throwing uh, very few of them were clean mm. they were all very very either slightly inaccurate they they were they were landing but not landing very cleanly at all. And they weren't powerful. When you have somebody that close to you, you need to be throwing powerful strikes. The kicks, the roundhouse, I mean, he has, he's a very good kicker. Mm. They say, what, Kung Fu fighter? Yeah. Which um, we've spoke about before. Yeah. But um, his kicks are very high level. But even then, there's not a lot behind him. Mm. Not for what they could be. And he could have caused some serious damage because he was throwing a good range of kicks. Yeah. But they just weren't doing 
anything and that would have been potentially that and the boxing would have really thrilled fighters in my opinion and I, I think my last point on it as well Kevin Holland obviously moving down from, from middleweight to welterweight it seemed like he carried that power with him obviously he's always been a very hard hitting guy but the whole fight for me it seemed like Kevin Holland was trying to steal a decision and Jack Della Madeleine was trying to take his head off any chance he could and Jack fought smart, it's not like he was reckless with it, and I think that's why he got the decision win. I think anyone who thinks Kevin Holland won, because I saw some of that, is just just weird. They're just trying to cope. Obviously, people are trying, big fans of Kevin Holland. Um, but like, you can get mistaken that he won because he landed more strikes, but I'm sorry, Jack. That, yeah. No, <laughs> that's, that's that on that one, in my opinion. Did he, did he land more strikes? I knew he landed more leg strikes. Was it? Maybe not more strikes. But I think, I think the head of the body, yeah, Jack pieced him up. Yeah, maybe. But just like watching it live, it seemed like Holland was doing a lot more, but he was just hitting the guard most of the time, wasn't he? So. Well, that, that's the thing. They, they weren't clean strikes, and he didn't fight that fight correctly. Um, Obviously, he should have been wrestling more. But there's no reason why he shouldn't have been wrestling. Um, he's very good on the feet, but wrestling would have been what he would have struggled with. Mm. You know, he's very good on the ground, Kevin Holland. His wrestling is pretty trash, though. It but is. His it jiu-jitsu, is jiu-jitsu, if he can get you there, I mean, you submit some great people. And that's the thing, you know, even if you attempt 10 in a fight, you know, yeah. 15 minutes. That would have been the smart fight, thing to do. That, that would have been a lot more beneficial I think it's always being a bit more aggressive mm. and being a bit more on the forefront because a fighter like Jack he, if you give him the opportunity to he, he will fight you in the yeah. pocket he will throw big shots at you these are heavy heavy shots Um, y- this is somebody which you should very much have a physical advantage over although Jack is a yeah. quite a large guy for his you know for his size uh, for his size for his weight but um yeah, no, it's an overall um, disappointing performance from Kevin, yeah, I thought. I agree. And uh, he looked shocked as well yeah. in the decision. What do you think he... I didn't... I can't remember. I think... Um, I may, may, maybe I'm wrong, maybe You're I'm wrong, but he looked, he, he, looked, he looked quite disappointed surprised. and yeah. surprised and, you know... Well, that's what you get, you know. I think sometimes it comes around to bite, so bite someone on the ass when they act like the way he does, and I think that's just an example of it. But um, we're going to jump into the main event, main event. Me and you haven't spoke about this one at all, so I'm really interested to hear your view on it. Um, obviously, a split draw in the end. A lot of people think Shevchenko won. A lot of people think Grasso won. In my opinion, it all comes down to that fourth round. Um, obviously, Grasso won the second with the big knockdown. Shevchenko dominated large parts of the fight, but she was just losing out in the big moments. Um, I'm going to get straight into it. Who do you think won the fight? Honestly, I think Grasso. Really? I really do. I think that what she was doing on the ground, just the damage overall, it's hard to piece it round by round. Mm. I remember what happened round yeah. by round, but it's hard to yeah. remember exactly where it happened. But um, I just thought that there, there were there were times in which they were both dominant. Mm, but on the feet, they were very, very similar. Mm. And it's one of these things, I think, although ideally you'd want to see a winner come out of that, because I think that although, yes, jaws are fun and they're cool, you know, a, a fight like that, you want to see who aged it. I think that Grasso took it, in my opinion. Yeah. I can see why you say Shevchenko did, though. And I think that it was it's just such a crazy fight. Yeah, well... That's the thing, it's just an age. Yeah, well, the thing is, for me, is... Um, just getting on to the judge here, because it's quite... Why do we have to come on it every week and talk about judging? And someone gave that last round. This is why it was a draw. I mean, I would have understood a draw if they gave the fourth round a draw in that round because it was just so hard to tell who won that fourth round. But someone gave Garasso a 10-8 in the fifth round. Do you, do you not agree with that? No, that's just crazy. But about how dominant she was on the ground. No, but she got dominated on the feet, danced around and jabbed up for the first two and a half minutes of that round. Maybe I minutes. wouldn't say so, not for the fifth round. I really wouldn't. I, I think she was. She, I thought it was very she was, even. I think she most. was struggling to find her range and she got the takedown and she landed some good ground and pound shots and almost got a submission in, but for a 10-8... A 10 8 should be you multiple times you almost get them out there. So I, it is hard, really, because if if she was a bit more dominant on the feet, I think a 10 8 would be appropriate. Yeah, if but she on was... the feet, they were so close, it was so tight. I, I don't say she was just dancing around and jabbing, I'd say she was doing more. I think that they were both playing it, not, I don't say cautious because it was not cautious whatsoever, 
but it, it was very it was very technical my feet. But I do think, but I think until the obviously Shevchenko made the horrible mistake in trying to get that head and arm throw and just got dumped mm-hmm. because of it. Uh, but until then, I do feel like Shevchenko was using her footwork. And uh, Grasso just could not find her range, and she ate so many jabs. Her head was getting snapped back. Obviously, there's a big power difference during the fight, and um, every time Grasso landed, it looked like it affected Shevchenko a lot more. And I'm not mad that you think Grasso won. I, I at, the, at first I thought Shevchenko won, and then I thought Grasso won, and then I watched it back again, and I'm kind of leaning Shevchenko. But you know, the fight was just so close. Uh, I think I was get that's the breakdown. But do you think uh, they should just run this fight back straight away? I think you have to. Yeah. I think that's the only logical thing to do when a fight tackle is when you score a draw. There, there's no way you can't not run that back up. And then they should just do Blanchfield Santos, and the winner of that fight is the winner of that one. I think that's the best way to do it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. No, not Blanchfield Santos. Not, sorry, yeah, Blanchfield yeah. Ferro. I was, I was, I was thinking yeah, that just, just happened. like happened. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, I do, I do agree with that. I think that makes the most sense logically. I think you need to run it back right away because when you have a fight that close and you score a draw, it being scored a draw is what makes you have to run it back, in my mm. opinion. And sorry to interrupt. Another thing I want to get out of there, in my opinion, one of the best women's fight of all time. Just the skill and technical ability on show. It wasn't action packed the whole way through but just the big moments on a title fight on such a big stage the card built around Alex Grasso and both them fighters went to war and you just got to give them both so much respect oh yeah definitely so it's one of those things it's, it wasn't scrappy at all no it was so technical it was so clean there was everything in there really that knockdown in the second round the combination just that three piece knock Shevchenko down was so clean. Shevchenko's groundwork. Yeah. I was honestly I was so impressed with that. Yeah. She's she's very versatile, everyone knows that. And and Grass as well. But she was so so when she was in the dominant position in the ground, her jiu jitsu, the way the way they because they were both in hard positions yeah. at times. Yeah. Like, both really hard. And that, that, that triangle team. lock. Yeah. Like that that was like how long did that last? Like two what, or three minutes? Yeah. Uh, was it the mountain guillotine? I think I know the triangle lock. But there was one way show. I think she sent two different subs, mm. and then maybe there was like a there's an armbar or something. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna yeah, mixed up, but like it was like there for like three minutes, and um I think that uh, there was a there's a body triangle as well. Yeah, you know which um she just couldn't. Yeah, she had her back for a while with that body triangle. Yeah, but she, she did so well to get out of it. Yeah, and the Grasso strength as well. So calm in those positions. But the strength it required to get out of that. Yeah, because that was in tight. You know mm. the flexibility from. Shevchenko and the, the, the strength from Grasso is it's nuts really, yeah. you know. But um, it's it's an awesome, exhausting position to be in, mm. as well, I imagine. For both, yeah. You know, trying trying to keep hold of that and trying to get out of that, yeah. you know, required a lot of uh, power. But like you said, the calmness, because mm. that is not a situation you which a lot of people are going to be calm in. When she was in that Mount of Guillotine, she must have been in it for about two minutes, and Shevchenko just sort of had her wrapped up high on the neck. Her legs were kind of wrapped around the shoulders and. Grasso, you could just see her breathing slowly. Obviously, um, I had a friend who compared it to the Volkanovski one, where Volk was obviously mounted with the guillotine with Ortega, and he was flapping around like a salmon. Obviously, not as bad, but the way Grasso is just calm in such a big moment as well. All the fans there for her, and she managed to stay calm, keep her cool against one of the best female fighters ever. And I mean, debatably, could, should have come out with the win. May, maybe not, but, you know, everyone's got different opinions on that. And I want to see the fight again. I think Grasso has a great chance of beating Shevchenko because, you know, she's only going to get more used to fighting Shevchenko. Shevchenko's 35, and Grasso's like 29, 30. So, mm. you know, there's a, only one of them is going to be getting better, aren't they? It's just one of those things that's... Um, you're always going to have split opinions on mm. who won that yeah and um, i think that a draw kind of makes it better mm. because it there's there's no way you can call that robbery and we get to see it again which i'm so happy about well quite literally yeah um so we're ready to get into the uh next week's predictions um we're we're going to concentrate on a few a few of the cards later on but we'll give a little breakdown on the whole main card because i actually think this is a solid fight night i don't i don't know what you thought of the card uh, so overall, this is this is a really good fight night. This is almost like what you kind of want to see on like a low level main card. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's this stacked 
I actually started yeah, even on the main event. Like, yeah, I think yeah. that could be on the main card. Yeah, I yeah. really do. Like, yeah, that could be like a just below the co main of the pay per view, that main event. <laughs> oh, quite literally. Yeah, and obviously, there's some uh, banger fights on the prelims. Tim Means on the prelims. Miles Johns, Jacob Malkoon, obviously, Mohammed Usman, Kamar Usman's brother. Um, but we're getting stuck into the main card. The first fight, uh, Ricardo Rama, Ramos, obviously, very dynamic kickboxer, good ground game too, against. Every, well, not everyone's favourite fighter, but one of everyone's favourite to watch, Charles Jordan, puts on banger after banger. Um, I think this is a great stylistic matchup. Obviously, Ricardo Ramos has the sort of more wild striking style, got plenty of spinning elbow wins in the UFC, uh, has nasty spinning kicks, nasty flat knees, jumping switch kicks, you know, he throws it all out there. How excited are you for this stylistic matchup? So, stylistically, I think that this is. This is a hard fight to call, but I think I know who's who's coming out on top. Um, overall, like this is just a very very exciting fight. These are two very exciting fighters. Um, they're different but they're similar. Mm. And that's like, that sounds very contradictory, but they are. <laughs> they the way they fight. They're both they they they're both very capable yeah. of knocking opponents out. And I think stylistically, you know, just they're both powerful, aggressive. Fighters and um, I think stylistically this is kind of perfect, really. Yeah, I think this has the potential to be maybe fight of the night on this main event. I don't main, main card, sorry. Um, prediction: I think I am leaning towards Charles Jordan because I feel he's the more clean technical striker. Obviously, Ricardo Ramos, he has a chance to finish anyone on the planet if he's really on it, and we've seen him obviously get some nasty KOs in the UFC. But I feel like Charles Jordan is going to be able to slowly break him down. And I'm going to go a Charles Jordan decision. So it's interesting you say that. Um, I'm actually going to go... I'm going to say Charles Jordan decision. Because I think that I can't see him being finished. Mm. It's, it's a very hard to finish Charles Jordan. I do think though with this fight, Charles Jordan is a type of fighter which Ricardo Ramos does well against. Because mm. you look at a lot of these fighters, these... He does. He's not the most active, isn't he? He's not throwing these massive, fast combinations. No. He's not always necessarily the most aggressive. But you look at how he fights. A lot of these big shots, when he gets backed up, he's very calm. He can take a lot of damage, mm. and he throws. He lands most of his, a lot of his finishes, when he's backed up against the cage, oh, when yeah. he's on the back foot. And with Charles Jordan, Charles Jordan, he'll he'll run at you. He'll throw a flying knee. He's got very good boxing. He's, Kicking, yeah, his leg kicks, his roundhouse, uh, you know, he, he's got it all really. I mean, his nickname is Charles Air Jordan for a reason. He well, loves any attack that's going to be sending him through the air quite literally. But with Ricardo Ramos, he does well with fighters who run at him mm. because he, he's just he's just hard, like mm. he, he really is. You know, you look at a lot of these spinning elbows, um, he, he's backed up into a corner, and he's just spinning around. There was one, elbows. I think there was one, I, I want to say he was fighting Andre Lusa, but I could be wrong on that one. Um, I can't remember. Let me just check. I think actually no, it might have been uh Tagorov, Zabira Tagorov, where Tagorov was hurting him early in the first round, and um, Tabor Tagorov was had him against the fence, and he dips a big right hand and lands the spinning elbow, and has him wobbling all over the place, and nearly gets another finish from that one. And uh, it just showed it showed it in slow mo, and he saw the right hand come in and dipped at the perfect time and landed it clean. I don't know how Sabor Tagorov just took that, but yeah, he he shows that he can land these big shots through his smart IQ in there, not just from throwing them out there, you know. I think on the Tahiti as well. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I think that was that also a spinning elbow. Yeah. Uh, no, he didn't win that one by spinning elbow. I think he lost decision on that one. No, 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 Tahiti. No, the um, it was a, it was a uh, finish round through. Yeah, maybe actually. I, I can't remember. No, 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 I'm on about this one. Tagorov. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I'm on about a much earlier one. Oh, right. Wait, wait, wait. Well, he, he knocked him out this minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so, yeah I, I think that's the one where he was backed up against. That might have been one of his first fights in the UFC. Maybe a debut, even. I think he might have four or three spinning elbow knockouts in the UFC. I mean, it's nuts, really. Maybe, maybe the answer to finishing Bantamweights in 
feed these light guys just throwing spinning elbows. Molly McCann, it was working for her for a while. Well, to be fair, to be fair, and it's, it's one of those things that I mean, I can't imagine it's nice to be hit by a spinning elbow. No, no, I mean, it, they, it doesn't look like they like it when it happens. So. I, feel, I feel like this fight, though, I think you might have taken one beforehand. Who? It's a hobby. What, uh... Spinning elbow. I'm not sure. I oh, it, it was it was a long time ago. But um, yeah, no. Uh, so this is a really exciting fight. Um, Charles Jordan, he's so exciting. His fight against Daniel Wood in Paris, mm. that was sick. I mean, yeah. uh, all his fights are sick, really. Yeah. And he's just a really exciting fight. Um, the Andre Philly fight was a banger as well. Yeah, quite literally. Uh, this this could be five night. Yeah, I think so. Um, so what you went decision two? We're both agreeing on that one. So I I think I think so. I I can't see him looking mm. at Charles Jordan. Or maybe for a spinning elbow. Hopefully, you know, I just I just love knockouts, so yeah, but, I, but I can't see any of them finishing each other. Um, getting into the next fight, uh, a great fight in my opinion. Brian Battle, obviously coming off tough, I think he was the tough winner fighting AJ Fletcher. Um, I think AJ Fletcher has struggled with reach a lot in the past, and he's suffering with reach a lot in this fight too because it's 10 inches he's given up in reach advantage and Brian Battle knows how to use that reach so that is going to be extremely hard for AJ Fletcher to try and get in on him I think when when it's a slow paced fight AJ Fletcher can sort of look technical his kickboxing is pretty decent his wrestling his jiu-jitsu he's a well-rounded fighter but you know once you get the uh once you get the fight kind of scrappy with him like andre lusa did that's why i got him confused because i watched this fight earlier andre lusa just put it on him and you know he was winning the first two minutes of that round and then started getting hit with big shots and the fight changed from there so i think brian battle needs to apply the pressure early to try and hit him with some big shots make it a bit of a messy one from distance and um i think that's how he gets the finish but how do you see this fight going so um with this one here it's an interesting one uh with um aj fletcher something i feel like i don't want to say his striking is basic because it's not basic at all but his his boxing is very very good like you said he does struggle with reach mm. and he does often do well when he's fighting as fighters who are a bit more close in the pocket when it comes down to round battle his range is so good and his just his his kicking his variety of kicks he throws is very high level something i have noticed about brian battle though is that his Taking on defense just isn't always there, mm. and I feel like with the wrestling of AJ Fletcher, I, I don't know whether he'll wrestle. It's going to be hard to wrestle against somebody with a ten inch reach advantage who can throw kicks like that, who can keep you at bay. I feel like that could potentially be an issue mm. because AJ Fletcher is also somebody who is very tough, yeah, and will just walk through. And something which I feel like Brian Battle does sometimes struggle with is when fighters do apply the pressure. And when we do break through, which is something AJ Fletcher could do. Um, seeing him on the ground, I can't say I've seen enough of Brown Battle on the ground from what I've seen. It's not been too yeah. impressive. No, he's struggled on the ground a little bit. He's got uh, some nasty front lock chokes, like his front lock guillotine, his hand in guillotine. Like, so if you give him your neck, he will snatch it up. But his wrestling defense isn't all there. And I, I think it's also important to remember, like, if you look at who he's been fighting, wrestler wise mm. the fighters who can wrestle they're all very high level yeah and it's it's hard because when you're fighting people like that it's hard to split it. um overall i think his, his wrestling defense isn't quite good enough um I, you do see me for a single leg every so often yeah right about which is um, interesting you know he doesn't really pull him off uh but i've been going to see how he does that although in my opinion i don't think wrestling is going to be the logical thing to do no. to, to win this fight um at all really i think that if he keeps his range um i'm gonna go with a decision yeah brian battle i think he's just gonna keep him at bay um i think aj fletcher is gonna he's gonna have to clear in. yeah there, there's no other way about mm. it really and i think when he does close in if he is able to land the takedown then there could be a lot of issues with brian battle i mean he's we've seen him beating up savage on the ground yeah we've seen him bullying on the ground and mm. i think that's something which aj fletcher could definitely do but I, it's one of these things like it's it's very 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 hard to call, and um, it all depends on how it goes. But I think if Brian Battle keeps his range, then I could see this thing going his way. Yeah, I think um, although if AJ Fletcher is able to just topple him, I'm I'm gonna go I'm gonna go with something different this round this uh, this fight. I'm gonna go Brown to finish AJ Fletcher. Yeah, just ground strikes. So yeah, wait, you just just changed it up. Changed it up. Why not? Why not? Yeah, fair enough. Um. So obviously, at the start you were gonna go decision um, battle, and 
I, c I can't understand why you were going that route, but I, I think that Brian Battle is going to get the TKO in this one. Okay. I think the range will be too much, and um, obviously I do think AJ Fletcher is a better fight than, fighter than what he's shown. Uh, he's looked very good in some fights, but I think Brian Battle, the reach is just going to be too much, and I think he'll get the finish in the second round. I, I could see that potentially, especially with his range. Yeah. It's, it's superior. Well, getting into the next fight, Marina Rodriguez versus Michelle Watson. Bit of a strange matchup considering I think these guys fought each other, I want to say four fights ago, which, yeah, four fights ago. And, you know, Michelle Watson's gone on to lose three fights since then, and Marina Rodriguez has won two. So, probably the strangest matchup I've seen as a UFC fan. Probably not, but one of them. And I think really breaking down this fight, it happened a year ago. We don't need to go too much into it. Uh, I think that it's going to go the same sort of way. I think the dis a decision from uh, Marina Rodriguez is probably the smart pick here. Uh, the strike in the kickboxing is just a bit too much for the sort of karate style of Michelle Watson, in my opinion. It's one of these things, I think, when you have two fighters with this liver kickboxing and this, what was this karate style? Um... It, it it's not. It, it's 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 very very hard for Michelle Watson to do what she does to a lot of these fighters. Mm. You know, obviously she's come off two losses, but um, regardless, she's still very good stylistically. She's still very sharp. Um, she's got some good wrestling to be fair. Yes, and I right. feel like and I feel like that's something which Mario might struggle with. Yeah. Potentially, you know, seeing her on the ground, um, she's not no, she's all not that great. at all. Really, and I think that could potentially be uh, a way she could go about it. But um, yeah, I'm going to have to agree with you. Yeah, I mean, the fight happened not that long ago. I think Marina's takedown defence would have got better since then, and it was a five-round fight last time. And, um, you know, Michelle Watson wasn't able to get much success off at all, so I don't think we have to spend ages breaking this one down. Like, I'd be surprised if it went any different from the last fight. I think it would be the same, just all packed into three rounds instead of five. She like a Brazilian Muay Thai champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nasty Muay Thai. Marina Rodriguez has her knockout of Amanda Rebas, the straight one too, is as clean as it gets. Um, but jumping into the co-main event, uh, great fight. Bryce Mitchell coming back after his first or second loss, if you want to count the tough one. Um, but yeah, I think that it's a great matchup. Danny Ige, uh, he's been bringing heat recently, getting him back in the win column. Bryce Mitchell coming off the tough loss to look uh, uh, to Poria. How do you think this one plays out? So um, it's really interesting. They're both very very good boxers, and this is what I'm excited about. Really, um, we look at Bryce Mitchell. Um, Bryce Mitchell's got everything on the feet and the wrestling, and the wrestling is gonna be so so difficult for Dan Ige to fight against. I mean, Dan Ige has got really good wrestling defense. Mm. And that is something which Bryce Mitchell is going to potentially have to try and cope with, just that level of... But uh, Dan Ige, is, he's so solid in yeah. his toughness, and he's so clinical, and he's so clean with striking. And it's not... It's it's not... I wouldn't say wild at all. No. It's just so clean and so tough. Uh, Bryce Mitchell, he's so promising. And the way he fights, it's, it's, it's like he's he's just so energetic. Yeah. You know, there's just so much power and energy behind it, and it's the the intensity of what Bryce Mitchell produces. I mean, his his wrestling in combination with his striking, um, got some good kicking about. Well. Yeah, it's gonna be really hard for Dan Ie to deal with. Dan Ie is tougher. Yeah, and I think that Dan Ie, if he can stuff his takedowns, he's gonna be doing very well on the feet, and I think that this could. In my opinion, I'm thinking Dan Ige decision. Mm. I think that the experience is there. Although saying that Bryce Mitchell, I mean, he's he's very hard to cope with, and I think that this is this is a really good test as well. Yeah, I um I do actually. I really want to agree with you on. I've been thinking all week. I've been thinking Dan Ige decision, and um I think that because watching the Tapora fight, I really think Bryce Mitchell kind of got exposed a little bit. He showed that maybe you can't wrestle against the top guys, and his striking. You know, against a good solid boxer, maybe isn't as good as you think. So, um, I do understand why you went with Dan Ige. I am very tempted to go with Dan Ige myself. Uh, but I think Bryce Mitchell, 
I think that what his game plan is not going to be a pretty one. I think there's going to be a lot of holding against the fence. I think there's going to be a lot of failed takedown attempt, and I think he's going to rack up on control time, land big shots in the clinch. And like you said, it's, I think you're a bit kind to him when you said he's a great boxer, but I think some of his kicks will be very effective in this one. Danny Gay, obviously not the tallest opponent. I think Bryce Mitchell is going to be looking to throw a lot of them kicks. And I think he's going to squeeze out a decision. I think that uh, Danny Gay, yeah. uh, I, 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 do, I do see a big way of victory for, for, in this one, but I think Bryce Mitchell is just going to be able to push a bit harder and get the decision win. Well, I, I do respect that. I can see that potentially being the case. Mm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go Danny Gay. Yeah, I like that. Well, you know, there's some differences here with us uh, on this card. Obviously, there's a lot of hard matches, matchups to call on this one. Uh, getting into the main event, uh, both fighters we're very big fans of. Obviously, we spoke in detail about the Gamrot, um, about the Gamrot uh, Taiyuki fight fight on this podcast, and how much we were entertained by that fight. But he's got a bit of a different stylistic matchup facing one of the best Muay Thai fighters in the UFC. It's, you know, the classic grappler versus striker matchup in this one. Um, and how, who do you think is going to prevail in that? So it's really mm-hmm. interesting because when I when I first started watching Gamera, I always kind of just thought he was a bit of a wrestler, mm. if I'm honest with you. Um, I wasn't really aware of how good a striker actually was. Gamera is so versatile. His his striker and fight, that was the reason why that's so exciting was because we had lots of Exciting wrestling, and by exciting wrestling, I don't mean holding against a cage. Not, not like you're scrambles. going to be doing matter either of which. Yeah. But um, overall, he, he's just so versatile in everything he does. He's powerful. I don't think he's 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 not as clean as striker as Fadeev. No, definitely you know, not. You look, you look at him, Shark. He does throw some good combinations, but for the most part, his boxing is very much one twos, one one twos, and heavy one twos yeah. at that. Uh, with Fadeev, Fadeev can pick you apart at any range really mm. within his range fighters. Um and he's also just so efficient with it as well. He's throwing everything at you. Yeah. And it's continuous and um, the Muay Thai, like you said, is nasty. The Z is a very high level opponent. It's a very stark division. Mm. It's a Definitely very, very stark division. Lightweight is just on fire right now. And uh I feel like looking at Ganrock, I mean his performances, he, he is a very T- tough up and coming fire. Yeah. He is still up and coming. He's um, I think he's what thirty. Yeah, really, still that young. Yeah, yeah, I think he might be like 30, 31 around that. Because I know when he, uh, I know when he fought Takuri, he was like, ah, he he's young, he's young. I know he is, I know he is. But yeah, no, he's still very much coming up and uh, thirty two years of age. Mm, yeah, still young. That's round like almost your prime, isn't it? And it, it's Fadiv is it's so experienced. Yeah, his um, his I think his kicks are going to be a really big issue. Mm. I think his distance management as well. Even if Gamera takes him down, I mean, there's even the ground. It'd be interesting to see how that would go because um, Gamera he's 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 very very versatile, like I said, and his wrestling is good. Like you said, wrestler versus or grappler versus Shuka, you know Shuka yeah. is. I think there's a bit more to it than that, <laughs> but um, overall this this fight I don't really know how to call it I, I can't see a finish maybe Fazeev could finish Gamrot I think that's a very high possibility Um, it's five rounds mm. and when it comes to five rounds five rounds is always it always plays out different to mm. how with three rounds Definitely. and I think that's something which Fazeev is going to benefit from just the general wearing him out from his kicks you know battering those legs oh. battering that body I do also think though we've seen perceived struggle in three round fights with cardio. Uh, obviously he looked good in the RDA fight, but in the fight with Justin Gaethje he slowed down a lot. The fight with Bobby Green slowed down a lot. So I think maybe it could really benefit Gamrot if he can. I don't think he's going to be able to take that a fresh Vazib down and hold him down. So he's going to need to wear on him, and uh, I think that's the way to victory for Gamrot. He's got to take it into deep waters. See, it's just one of those things. I think Gamble's gonna have a hard time though mm. getting that takedown. I really do. I think uh, with Fazeev just defending the takedowns and just getting in close. I mean, the distance management of Fazeev, the range, the variety of kicks he's throwing, the variety of strikes. He, he, it's not easy to get close to him without getting damaged, mm. and that's something Gamble's gonna need to be very, very cautious of because it's not gonna be hard for Fazeev to be causing serious damage up close and that's something which you can definitely say about Fazeev 
has the edge over mm. just the the variety of strikes the variety of tools he can use um gamrot although saying that is very very versatile but he's not the striker which the zebras whatsoever and i think that in these closer exchanges in these exchanges where he's coming forward i think that the can keep him at bay mm. at the same time if gamrot does wear him down he's going to be knackered yeah and then there's, there's no way that you're not because gamrot on top of you on the ground is going to be a very very draining experience mm. and you're going to be working incredibly hard to make sure that you're not being finished yeah um so you know, give us a prediction how do you think it goes so uh, it's really hard because five rounds mm. and five rounds is always it's always difficult to call because three rounds it, i'd say for the decision, decision yeah I, I would i would because i think that three rounds it's just not enough to get him worn down um i think Gamera, I think he's going to land a few takedowns. I think he's going to have a hard time doing it. I think he's going to manage the distance well. I can see him potentially finishing him. I'm going to say, I'm going to say fourth round finish. Well, for Zeev. Yeah, I I was thinking around along the same lines. I'm going to go third round TK for Zeev. I think Gamera, he's going to try take him down and he's going to struggle. And for Zeev's going to start damaging him and it's going to all add up maybe fourth round you could be right with that one but um you know i think if gamrock can have his way with the rest and wear for Zeev out you know, i would not be shocked if he can win a decision here well that's the thing and i mean to be fair it's, it's not as if gamrock couldn't finish him mm. you know if, if he's if he's maybe not something needy, maybe something yeah. he's not easy person to finish yeah we haven't seen for jiu-jitsu really we've only seen him stuff for loads of takedowns haven't we I'm um, asked the thing, you know, if we, it'd be interesting to see how he is on the ground mm. to really see what he's like in these situations. Um, I feel like Gamrot probably isn't the person to try and sit against no. it because Gamrot is, is, is Jiu Jitsu, he's a very high level, his wrestling, just his general, he, he's very much just a dominant individual mm. in everything he does. Everything he throws is um, in a very dominant, attempting manner, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically all for this week. Uh, I think there's no real news to talk about. Obviously, me and Solly spoke about a bit of news last week. I think we'll wait till next week to really see if anything big comes out. So um, I hope you enjoyed the podcast today. This has been the Combat Chats podcast. Uh, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. Give us five stars on Spotify. Share us around so we can get more known. And yeah, we hope you enjoyed.